In this video, we're going to look at the new Lin 360 loudspeaker. Hi, I'm Alan Serkham. Uh, I'm the editor of Hi-Fi Plus and uh, I had a chance for an exclusive uh, sneak preview of the new Lin 360 loudspeaker. Um, this is Lin's new uh, flagship design. It replaces the Climax 350. Uh, and um, I'm not going to talk too much about it. I'm actually going to pass it on to uh, a guy I interviewed in, uh, in the Lin factory, uh, uh, Phil Budd, who's the uh, technical brains behind this. He's far more erudite than I am on the product. And we'll come back afterwards uh, and I'll talk a little bit about, about it. Uh, so I'm Phil Budd. Uh, I'm head of the acoustical and mechanical design teams here at Lynn. Uh, I've been with the company now for whew, 18 and a half years, um, but my principal role is, is really designing loudspeakers for the company. Great. And we're here today to look at the new uh, 360. Mm -hmm. Our new baby. Yep. Um, so we have a vision at Lynn to create an audibly invisible loudspeaker. That's really our focus from uh, an acoustical design perspective. We want a loudspeaker that's gonna add nothing to the music, add no color, um, but also is gonna disappear within your room. Um, and that's a really important aspect of, of loudspeaker design that's, that's often missed. Um, so many people design in an anechoic or, or similar. Um, we're fully aware our customers listen in the room and the last thing that you want is the room overlaid on top of the, the sound stage that was captured in the recording. So you need to do a lot of work to, to try and mitigate those two things, both distortion and the impact of the room. So 10 years ago now, we introduced exact and space optimization, and they were really targeted towards achieving this. Space optimization uh, took out the, the worst of the impact of the room at low frequency and wrestled back control, if you like, to allow the, the loudspeaker to reproduce the low frequency as it should be. Um, exact treated the, the last and I think the, the most invasive form of distortion that was never dealt with by active systems and that's phase distortion, the inherent time distortion within any kind of analog uh, loudspeaker system, be it active or passive, um, so both in the crossovers and, and the drive units themselves within the, within the speaker. Removing that phase distortion it just gives a, a, a sense of space and clarity to every note because all of a sudden the fundamentals and every harmonic line up perfectly in time. Um, so you get a much better sound stage uh, from the speaker. You can really pick, because the harmonics and fundamental of every note in the space are preserved, you get a much better sound stage. Um, so both exact and space 10 years ago were a huge step towards our vision, but we knew we could do more. So as I've already said, our focus really to make the audibly invisible speaker is driving down distortion and dealing with room. So let's talk a bit more about what we've done new for the 360 loudspeaker um, to drive down distortion. So we have a full new suite of drive units um, and we'll start with the tweeter here which was kind of the epochal moment for us. Um, we've been looking for quite a long time to try and push resonance out of band. Um, historically, we've used a lot of soft materials for our drive units, mainly because we could never find a hard tweeter that we liked. Transitioning from a soft paper cone uh, onto a hard tweeter, you always hear that transition. It never works seamlessly. But we could never find a hard tweeter that we liked. Um, you'll remember back in the day, aluminium, titanium uh, domes always sounded like someone tapping a Coke can. They were never any fun to listen to. Um, coming into this, century, I guess, into this millennium. Uh, beryllium and diamond appeared on the market and we had to play with them. We really liked what they did. Um, but just about every unit out there was, was too big for us. We, we like a small form factor tweeter because it keeps dispersion really wide. Um, all of the, the hard tweeters out there are an inch or bigger and we found it just narrows things down as you get to the, the higher octaves. So uh, a few years back, uh, Round about lockdown kind of time, we tooled up a, a smaller beryllium uh, tweeter, the 19 millimeter unit that we're using here. And that was the moment we said, right, we can do this. So the next unit to tackle was the mid-range. 
Um, the mid-range, historically, we've used a polyurethane elastomer in the mid-range, which was very, very neutral um, because it was so heavily damped. Um, the resonance was in band, but it was, it was very well treated. But again, we want to push things out of band and take that distortion away from what you're hearing. Um, so we've actually used a, a new material. It's a thin uh, ply carbon fiber weave. Um, you will have seen it in some other uh, applications, obviously. Um, but it originally found use uh, with NASA in their Mars rover. So, um, you know, we, it's not often I get to talk about rocket science, but I guess in this case, we can actually say we've got a bit of uh, space technology going on within our, our loudspeaker. Um, again, this material has allowed us to push the resonance of, of the diaphragm a full two and a half, three octaves above its usable range. So out of the realms of what you're gonna hear. For the upper base and lower base, it, it's a mix of um, aluminium magnesium. It's, it's an alloy um, that's suitably stiff, uh, suitably light for our application. So again, we're pushing resonance out of band of those two drive units. Just doing that by, by going hard um, and pushing all that resonance out of band, suddenly we have a much more transparent view into the music. We don't get any color from the drive units. They're, they're just acting like pure pistons in their operating range. So there's no added distortion from those units. The two base units are worth mentioning because of the just vast excursion that they offer. Um, our, they're doubling what we could previously do. The linear range of these units is greater than we used to achieve in maximum excursion terms with our previous eight inch subwoofer units. They've got huge, huge capability. I mean, proper room shaking base from these things. And what material are they? Uh, again, they're an aluminium uh, diaphragm. It's, we're using these up to about 100 Hertz before we switch over to the 360 array. We wanna keep the top of the speaker essentially is a full range, and this almost like a, a supporting subwoofer. Okay. Um, it helps keep everything, all of the vocal, all of the sound stage on a, on a level. Mm. Um, yeah, we, we don't, it's quite, it, it's often easier with a loudspeaker design to let uh, the bass units go up to around 300 to transition across. Um, we feel it damages the image somewhat. Things wander up and down the cabinet as you're listening and you lose the sense of, of well, you gain the sense of listening to a loudspeaker, and that's not what we want to achieve. We want that audible invisibility. Sure. Um, so the next thing we've done for distortion is to really take a lot of focus on the amplifier technology that we're applying. One of our key strengths at Lynn is integration. We've done integrated loudspeakers, active loudspeakers for a number of years now. Um, the easy thing to do once you've got a wonderful suite of drive units is to go, right, what amp technology do we have? Let's take that, we have an amp platform, put it in, job done. We knew we could do more, so we've gone and invented two new amplifier technologies specifically for this loudspeaker to be perfectly tailored to the job that they're doing within the loudspeaker. So for the bass system, we have an all new Lin power DAC uh, where we've taken the digital part as far as is possible, all the way through the chain to the very output stage of the amplifier. Now, there's some other clever bits and pieces that we're doing with that power DAC. It's, it's not just a class D with the digital input. The digital input comes straight from our exact link. Um, we then have an FPGA doing the demodulation stages and conversion into PWM. That was derived from our organic DAC. That's essentially, it's very similar to the front end of our organic DAC. Um, only then, at the, the very last stage, do we convert to an analog waveform through the power stages of, of the power DAC. Um, we then filter for high frequency noise as is normal in a kind of class D application, but then what we do is take the output signal and run that through an ADC back into the FPGA that's controlling the power DAC. So we have a digital control loop around it. Really useful when you're using a digital input, obviously. Um, so we can, in infinitesimally real time, monitor what the, the, the amplifier is doing and guarantee that we've got a stable control loop around it. Um, so we've got this highly efficient power DAC um, that is ridiculously low uh, distortion. Um, we're kind of limited, basically it's the distortion of the ADC. That's the only distortion that's left within it. If we could put a perfect ADC in there, we would have a perfect amplifier. Um, 
And the other unique characteristic of the power DAC um, compared to conventional amplification, in a normal amplifier, as you raise the signal level, the noise level comes with it. So you end up with a pretty constant signal-to-noise ratio. Because our noise level is controlled in the digital domain, it stays at a fixed level. So as you raise the output level, your signal-to-noise actually gets better. So the harder you play the speaker, the cleaner that bass gets, which is a pretty new in the industry. So very efficient, uh, very low output impedance, really strong grip on the bass units. It's perfectly tailored for low frequency application. As we move up the speaker, we have another new amplifier technology, which we call adaptive bias control. Now, uh, you probably understand bias in a class A or class B amplifier and roughly what it does. Essentially, you have two, um, two transistors at the output stage of your amplifier, one for positive signal, one for negative signal. What's a transistor, isn't it? It's sort of, it's, it's a transistor, we yeah. still use them, yeah. yeah they sound a bit old school, but yeah. we do still use them. They no, 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 basically... I'm, st I'm still on valves. <laughs> <laughs> You're still on valves. Yeah, uh, a transistor got, is a modern valve. Yeah, that's, <laughs> that's it. There we go. Um, it converts a small that. signal yeah. into a big signal. Um, so that's your amplifier. <laughs> in, in broad terms, that's a transistor. Um, I so, think, in fairness, the reason I say that, a lot of people when they, they, in the audio industry, when they think of bias, they think of it in terms of biasing a, 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 tri, a, a power tube on a valve amplifier, tube amplifier. It's there for basically the same purpose. The, the bias is really there to keep the tube awake, or yep. in the transistor terms, to keep the transistor awake. Yep. So because we have one dealing with positive signal, one dealing with negative signal, as the signal travels through the transition, through zero, you need to make sure that both are awake, otherwise you will get what's known as crossover distortion. Um, so in a class A design, uh, they normally sound great, but they're woefully inefficient. You have both things on full tilt all the time, no matter what signal is going through them, and that manages that transition. Class B is more efficient, and in a perfect class B that can never really exist, they would only turn on instantaneously when they're required to turn on, but that's never really going to work. You'll, you'll get crossover distortion. So the bias current is there to keep them both just awake to deal with that transition. The problem that you have with setting a bias current is that it varies with so many different things. It varies largely with temperature. So depending on your playback level, how hot the transistors or valves are, um, you need a different bias current. Um, no transistor is the same as another transistor, or no pair is the same as another pair, so you need to be able to manage that. Um, also, depending on the frequency of signal going through, how quickly you're passing through zero, you need a different bias current. So traditional control circuits in analog amplifiers have, you do your best stab. You think where, roughly where you're going to want it to be. Even if you built in some temperature sensing, it tends to be laggy, doesn't quite keep up with the real system. So you never quite get the right bias, and you can end up being a long way off the perfect bias, which is why amplifiers have distortion. In the adaptive bias control amplifier, um, we do love our FPGAs, our computer controller thing, so we've dropped an FPGA in, and what we do is we sample the input current to the transistor pair and the output current to the transistor pair. We digitize those into um, the FPGA and we've got some uh, Lin bespoke written algorithms which look at all of the aspects that I've spoken about just now um, and optimize in real time the preferred bias current. They find the optimum bias current and ensure that the amplifier, each amplifier is sat at just the right bias level for the job that it's doing at that time. And this has driven distortion down compared to our previous class a, uh, class B and class AB designs by about 10 to 15 dB, um, certainly at tweeter level. So again, we have a bespoke tailored technology here, but even beyond that, uh, I mentioned earlier that the, f uh, the signal frequency affects the bias level that you need to set. Obviously, we have three different signal frequencies and signal bandwidths here. So within that algorithm, each individual amplifier driving the three units is actually tailored for its specific unit because it's applying a different bias control for each one to guarantee that we get the lowest distortion possible. So as I said, a key strength for Lin is integration and we've really pushed that with this loudspeaker. We've gone further than we ever have done before in terms of really um, leveraging that, that, um, that ability that we have within, within design. Um, to minimise distortion in every aspect of what we're doing here. 
So that's, that's where we're driving down distortion. Now, obviously, I also spoke about removing the rum um, to make uh, the loudspeaker disappear or the sense of a loudspeaker being in a room to disappear. So we dealt with the low frequency with space optimization and we've been refining that over the years. We're actually adding some features to, to space in managed systems just coming up soon, so watch out for those. But in terms of dealing with the mid frequencies and high frequencies, um, there's a couple of approaches. One, you can go mad and treat your room and turn it into an anechoic chamber, but no one really wants to live like that. So um, we need to look at what we can do as a company and as within acoustic design and product design to actually produce a loudspeaker that will allow the room to disappear. Now, the trick to that really is, is designing for dispersion. So in acoustics, we have uh, something called the precedence effect, which you may have heard of. Um, it's basically when you, when it's the point at which you perceive a second sound source as opposed to the first sound source. So if you have two things producing the same basic frequency response and they arrive within about 30 milliseconds of each other, the second one will just provide support to the first. So if you think about a, re a reflection within a room, um, if there's any frequency difference between the two in terms of the frequency response, so from the direct sound to that reflected sound, you will hear the reflection if there's this difference. If it's a very similar frequency response, ideally with a little bit less high frequency, then you don't hear it. It just supports the direct sound. So the human auditory system only hears what's coming direct from the speaker. Everything else just su provides support. So we knew we wanted to design for great dispersion. So you can see the sculpted shape of the 360 uh, loudspeaker. That was an awful lot of work initially for, for myself and the acoustics team with uh, console simulations, working out exactly how we were going to transition from each drive unit onto the baffle, the minimum radius we would require to guarantee there were no sharp transitions or anything messing up this dispersion contour from the loudspeaker. Those requirements were handed to our product designers who then had to produce a cabinet that achieved that. And uh, yeah, they, we've worked wonders with this. It's um, the dispersion characteristic is, I would say, second to none. I've not seen any better, but we've also managed to maintain a, a really foxy looking speaker. It's, you know, we've, we've not gone too techy with it. We've kept it as simple and as as recognizably a loudspeaker as we can. We don't want to, yeah, we don't want to, uh, a Cyberman sat in your living room. We want, you know, we want this to blend in and be part of your home listening experience. So by dealing with dispersion, we've taken out the other bit of the room now. So all you hear is the, the sense of space that's captured by the recording. You don't hear that overlaid with your room. Um, so that's been the key kind of technological focus for our design. Um, and beyond that, obviously, as I say, you've seen the, the wonderful Clyde built finish we have here. We have yep. some other special finishes coming out in the Glasgow collection. Um, we have some fantastically detailed uh, array fascia and trim work on here, all milled from solid bits of aluminium and, uh, and anodized. Um, it really is some of the most um, glamorous features, features, shall we say, the most luxurious features we've ever placed on the front of one of our loudspeakers. Excellent. And any speaker that is, uh, is called a single malt is fine by me <laughs> as well. That's, uh, that's on a personal level. Anyway, <laughs> well, look, thank you very much. And uh, yeah, well, look, we look forward to hearing it. Good. I hope you enjoy. I'm sure you will. Thanks, Phil. That was, um, was quite some briefing. Um, Lynn have moved away from their uh, traditional array of, of, of drive units, um, which they've been using for, for, for many, many years with the uh, 360. Um, this is quite a bold departure for them. Uh, it's a bold departure in, in, in many ways. It's, 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 it's new ground for them, but it, kind of, it works. The, 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 I've, I've known Lynn loudspeakers for years. I, I, it's no secret I used to sell them back in the 1980s in my first real job in audio. Um, at the time, the Lynn Cans and Saras and Isobarics were boundary speakers. They were speakers you put up against a, a, a wall. Um, and they did great things. Um, they sounded really exciting and they sounded powerful and amazing at the time. But there was always something missing, I think, from those first ones. And that, 
something was imagery. Now, they got a lot better over the years. Each successive generation of loudspeakers has got more detailed, more accurate. It's, a, it's always been that characteristically dry Lin sound. But the imagery was always goodish. It could get very it could get very good, but it was always a secondary concern. I think with this, they've actually moved on. They've made a loudspeaker that has a really, really strong image. Not just that, they've made a loudspeaker that has a really strong image, but it also, it, it does all the things that traditional Lin loudspeakers did. It does have that detail, it does have that fun, it does go loud, it does do all the things that you want a loudspeaker to do. We're, I'm going to have a little cutaway here um, and I'm going to play a few seconds of, of, a, of a Trent Muller track that I, I play quite a lot. And you can just see the excursion of the drive units. Just look at this for a few seconds. So yeah, those drive units can really move and they can really move air. That was a lot of noise. But it was organised and it was tidy and it was fun and it was exciting and I think that's the key thing about this is that this is a loudspeaker that does all those things, but it also does the imagery. It also does that beautiful stereo when you want it. It does some very, very good sound staging. But more importantly, it does it around the room. It doesn't have to be, you don't have to sit in the sweet spot. You don't have to l sit and listen in one he small head spaced. You don't have to have your head clamped to listen to stereo. It gives a good stereo image, more or less where you are in the room. It's not an omnidirectional, but it gets close. Um, and I think that's great. And with the space optimization system that they use in their active loudspeakers especially, it, it, it's something that I think works really, really well in, in smaller rooms than you'd expect. No, these loudspeakers are not huge by um, high-end standards. I mean, they're, they're big speakers, but they're not that much larger than the Climax 350. But I, I think with the optimization, they can go into a, a, a smaller room than you might expect. And, and that, I think, is, is a, a key thing. Obviously, they also have the ability to play really well good in a, in, in a big room, and if you want to run them uh, in passive, with your own amplification, they'll do good there. But I think really they, the ones that we've heard that sounded so good were um, active, fully active loudspeakers with, with the digital active and uh, space optimization EQ. So really was just sounding so direct. And another thing that I like about Lin speakers in general, and this has got much more so, is that I think w what they do is that they're not, f in the nicest possible way, they're not fussy. They won't demand audiophile grade music. They won't demand um, that you, <laughs> there are pieces of music that you can't play anymore. If you want to sit and listen to <laughs> terrible rock music that you really love, but sounds like it was recorded in a, in a, bucket it'll play nice it'll play as good as it can and I think that's what it's good it's it I played a couple of tracks that were really quite too compressed they were really in the sort of the <laughs> casualties of the loudness war and it doesn't make them wonderful but it doesn't make them unlistenable and I think that's really good I mean that's in a way that's a thing that it's something something where I've always liked a little two-way loudspeaker because a two-way loudspeaker is unforgiving enough to not really highlight those limitations and now we've got this full range big loudspeaker that does the same thing and I think that's really worth looking at I think it's something that we need to take note of and I, and I, and I applaud Lynn for stepping up there are going to be people who think that the, they've pushed the, the range up. Some will like that, some will not, but I think it, it works. I think it's a product that is, it, it sets them out in the same way as the Lin LP12 has always been the reference point for people who want to buy a high-end turntable. You might 
choose another model you might go with whatever but it's always been there and I think this is them putting their flag in the high end ground of loudspeakers at that top end in the same way as the LP12 did 50 years ago um, and realistically that's that's great and, uh, and I find that this is probably the, the Lin loudspeaker I have I've had a love-hate relationship with that Lin loudspeakers at times but usually I've always respected them um, even if the ones that some of them along the way I've <laughs> chosen not to review but the ones recently have become really you know, there are there were very few things that you couldn't really tick off you couldn't see there were very few things that you, you you discounted they did good detail they did good they did good rhythm i know that the english people are obsessed with english audiophiles are obsessed with pace rhythm and timing and these did good pace rhythm and timing there's always been that, as I said, there's always been that characteristically dry sound. I, I, I like to think of it as, as dry like a martini, not dry like a desert. Um, and these still have that character, but there is more to the sound now. It's a bit more open and mellifluous and it's a bit more engaging in a kind of audiophile way because you have got that sound staging. And, and I think that's something truly exciting from Lynn uh, and, and I look forward to, to hearing what this can do not only at the 360 but possibly even at slightly lower levels we we love looking at, at, at products at, here at Hi-Fi Plus we love looking at products at, at that sort of more metropolitan uh, aesthetic things that fit into good listening rooms in 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 high-end apartments in London and, and New York and, and, and places where real estate is always going to be the most expensive thing in, in, in the room and you can't have a pair of full range large full range loudspeakers and I look forward to seeing what comes next from this project um, the, the 350s the 360s sorry are, are a, a very high-end proposition and they will remain a higher, they're a flagship, they will remain a higher proposition. But I think this is also, not only is it, is it, is it a clarion call for, for top-end audio, but I think it will filter through. I think it will be something that, that we will see in there more um, attainably priced and um, uh, ranges. And, and in loudspeakers that are, are yeah, sort of designed for that, as I said, for that metropolitan aesthetic and that I think is going to be truly exciting because if you get a loudspeaker that can do all the things that the Lin 360 can do um, and do them well but do them in a smaller form factor as well as do them in this form factor that's a really powerful set of products and in a way the limitation of these is, isn't is, is probably us because I think with the 360 when high-enders are, are, are used to putting together a, a package of amps and speakers and preamps and mix, pick, mix, picking and mixing and we also high especially in, in, in bigger systems we buy we almost buy by the yard and this is a loudspeaker that isn't eight foot tall I mean, it's a big loudspeaker but it's not it's not so imposing that somebody walks in your listening room and thinks okay this is a loudspeaker that's uh, it's 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 a physical shape but it's, it's a physical thing but it's not it's not pushing too far it's not being the the giant loudspeaker but it gives that kind of reproduction it gives a very strong full range reproduction at pace, at speed, and at volume, with a good sound stage, and with, and a good sound stage that you aren't the only person who hears it. So, what's wrong with this picture? <laughs> I don't think there's anything. So, yeah, that's my take on the uh, the Lin.
I, yeah, if we're looking, scrutinizing it at absolute levels, I'm sure there will be people who don't like that characteristic dryness to, to the loudspeaker, but it's not as dry as it used to be. It's not as, it, it, it's not as crisp a sound. No, that's the wrong term. It is a crisp sound, but it's not quite as, uh, it's, it's not, it's not quite as dry. I can't really say anything as previous models. It's a bit more fluid sounding than their predecessors. And, and I know some people will still say it's not fluid enough. I know there's some people who will criticize that it, it, I, I'm struggling to think what there is because it's an articulate speaker, it's a dynamic speaker, it's a, it's a, it, it, it gives good imaging, it gives good detail, it's, it's got a good sense of rhythm, and as I said, it can go very loud indeed. I think it's your ears or the room that go before it does. So it's, it's, a, it's a tough one to, to, to find, and, and as I said, I think a lot of it might be that a lot of the limitation of this loudspeaker might might be, if I'm truly honest, people who remember the Lynn Isobaric and didn't like it, or remembered a loudspeaker along the way, like the Celtic or something like that from the early 90s, and didn't like the look of it or didn't like the sound of it, and they're making the same assumption erroneously. Um, so yeah, I'm, I mean, my first impressions of this are, are excellent, and. I, I, I think it's going to be a surprising loudspeaker for a lot of people because I, I think people aren't expecting Lynn to do that. They have a preset idea of Lynn making very good turntables, good amplifiers and make loudspeakers. And actually what they're doing is making a front to back system that is pretty much as good as it gets. It might not be as good as it gets for you, but it is as good as it gets. And we can't really say fairer than that. So good on you, Lynn. Congratulations. And uh, that's that. So thank you very much.